American policy, we we put the Taliban there. We gave the money to the I, I to the we, Pakistanis. We this, the you're, Pakistanis. Bre you're breaking news here, Congressman. I don't think it's ever been reported uh, no, before in the United has States. Been. We funded the the Taliban through the Pakistanis, and all that money we could have cut off that money and stopped what was going on. We knew what was going on there. All we wanted was a stable, quiet Afghan. I, fellow citizens, these events are imposed upon the patriotic people of this country. A responsibility and a duty greater than that of any since the Civil War. Then it was a struggle to preserve the government of the United States. Now it is a struggle to preserve the financial honor of the government. Our freed embraces an honest dollar, an unpunished national credit, adequate revenues for the uses of the government, protection to labor and industry, preservation of the home market, and reciprocity which will extend our foreign market. <laughs> Upon this platform we stand and submit its declaration to the sober and considerate judgment of the American people. The bus is coming, and you can't get out of the way. So you can kind of freak out, and you gotta go. Oh, that bus is gonna hit me at some point, and, and even though you don't know how fast or how big. There is so much we don't know about Parkinson's disease. What exactly causes it, for instance? And why would someone at the age of 29 start to develop the symptoms? No one knows, but this we do know. Michael J. Fox has in many ways become the handsome face of Parkinson's. Did you know that he's had the disease for almost 19 years now? What is his life like day to day? And what is he planning on doing with the $200 million he has raised through his foundation? What can we all learn from him? I'll tell you, he doesn't do a lot of long interviews because he gets so tired nowadays. But on this day, he had a lot to say. You know, people, when I said I was going to be interviewing you, people will ask me, how's he doing? And I don't, again, I don't want to labor that but i but i'm just i mean you, you're doing okay yeah what i was going to say was that, that i refer to parkinson's and the effect it's had in my life as a gift and people are, are clearly dubious about that and 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 kind of wonder how i can say that but but i quantify I qualify by saying it's a gift that keeps on taking what it is a gift because it's really opened me up to to, to more kind of compassionate curious uh, risk-taking uh, person and, and, and it's given me a kind of a, I wouldn't call the foundation my magnus opus, but it, it's, it's definitely the most important thing I've ever done and, and will you know, probably do in my life. With a disease like Parkinson's, with humidity, for example, what, what, what's happening? I mean, what, what do you experience? It mean, has their own thing. It has their own their own version of it. I'm on and off. That's the story of my life, is when I'm on, when I'm off. For example, now I'm relatively on. And in the course of this interview, I'll probably tear towards being off. Um, and I'll try to correct that midstream with, with medication, but I sometimes catch it, sometimes I don't. And sometimes um, my brain is more receptive to it, and sometimes... across the leg it's gonna go somewhere so it's constantly moving it around until and then there'll be times when it'll just stop and be still I mean, right now for example if I wasn't talking with you if I was just sitting I'd be, I'd be perfectly still um, is, that, is that the stress part of it or is that the... yeah that's just the, the, again it's like the stuff that fires that tells you I want to pick up this glass it's firing to tell me that something is required of me here and, I, and, my, and, and my mind can't tell my brain what it is when you wake up in the morning, and you, is there a certain routine you have to go through? Um...
Parkinson's, it's like you're crossing the road and you get stuck in the middle. And you know the feet to behave. And then, and, and then I wait, you know, probably about half an hour, 45 minutes before I, I mean, I might take a half a pill just to get me started, but I might wait a couple hours to, before, depending on what my day requires of me, uh, to before I really kick in. Well, things like, you know, even, you know, tending to yourself, brushing your hair, uh, brushing your teeth. Well, those I, I I sometimes have the equivalent of an electric toothbrush without the necessity of a battery or a charger. I just... Um, put your hand in the... <laughs> yeah, put my hand in and let it go. Um, yeah, I mean, but all that stuff, again, it's... it's you just... I'm just used to it. I'm just used to it. it it's... it's it, any of us have whatever we face in our lives, you know, it's, it, we, we, we find ways to to deal and move forward. If we don't, it doesn't matter what you have, the result is going to be the same. You're not going to go forward, you're going to stagnate. And, 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 and it, it doesn't matter anyway. You know, right now we're in an extraordinary situation. I mean, I don't sit down for interviews every day. As surprising as it may seem, people are sick of seeing me. But, but um, it's a, it, it carries with it a certain amount of stress no matter how congenial and, and, and willing my participation is, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, say when my wife is driving and the car comes close and I go like this, and she's... It's a love. <laughs>
Hi, everybody. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk with you about some steps I just announced to protect the middle class, create jobs, and give our recovery an added shot of momentum. As you probably know, the income tax cuts that were put in place last decade are scheduled to expire on January 1st, along with a series of tax cuts for the middle class that we made soon after I took office. This would, all told, mean a tax increase of $3,000 for the typical family and could cost our economy well over a million jobs. At the same time, an impasse in Congress means unemployment insurance would expire for 2 million Americans who would lose their emergency assistance right in the middle of the holiday season. It would be a perfect storm that would set families, businesses, and our country back, just as we're recovering from a devastating recession and a decade of stagnant wages. To break the logjam, I initiated bipartisan discussions. And yesterday, I announced a framework for a solution that would head off this calamity. It would bring Americans additional tax relief, keep unemployment insurance in place, and provide new incentives for businesses to grow and hire. Now, I know some folks, even good friends, are unhappy with the plan. Because as with any negotiation, getting there required some give and take. In exchange for a temporary extension of the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, we're also able to protect key tax cuts for middle class families. Republicans were forced to end their obstruction of an extension of unemployment insurance. And we secured a payroll tax cut for workers, a tax cut you'll see right in your paycheck worth about $1,000 for a typical family, as well as tax breaks for college students and small businesses. I have no doubt that everyone will be able to find something in this compromise that they don't like. There are things in here that, frankly, I don't like, namely the extension of the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans at a time when we need to focus on bringing down the deficit. But this is not the end of this fight. These tax cuts will expire in two years, and I will continue to make the case to the American people about why I don't believe they should be renewed. In fact, I'm confident that as we make the tough choices to cut the deficit, it will become apparent that we can't afford to extend these tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans one day longer. Now, I've heard the argument that we should have fought on, that we should make Republicans pay a political price for holding tax cuts for the middle class hostage, even if it meant allowing unemployment insurance to end or taxes to go up on every American come January 1st. And even though it was unlikely, we could have done as well by waiting for the new Congress to arrive. But like I said yesterday, I'm not going to make the American people collateral damage to political infighting in Washington. I'm not going to play games with the lives of the American people or jeopardize our economy in order to score political points. That's not why you sent me here. For too long, Washington has been a place where any compromise was seen as a failure. He was born in 1783 in Caracas, Venezuela, to sixth-generation Spanish-Americans. Even on the streets of North America, there is little question of what he became. He was a freedom fighter anyway. Libertador. Hero. Simon Bolivar led troops to victory in 100 battles. His nickname is the Liberator for freeing six South American countries from Spanish rule. His sword is presented to heads of state, as Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez did in April to Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. But some think Simon Bolivar's death was never fully explained. His parents died of tuberculosis. So when Bolivar developed a chronic cough, fever, and weight loss, the same bacterial infection was suspected. He weighed barely 22 kilograms when he passed. Tuberculosis was listed as the cause of death. The gelatinous fluid covering the surface of the brain. But now, almost two centuries later, modern medicine is discovering a new possibility. This group of doctors meets annually to challenge medical autopsies of famous historical figures. In the past, the doctors studied Florence Nightingale, Joan of Arc, Claudius. First, they get the facts. The patient ate frugally and avoided spirits and tobacco. Then they hear the patient's condition. Dr. Paul Alwater is the Director of Infectious Diseases at the prestigious Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He had terrible headaches, the skin darkening, the weight loss, the weakness, uh, the gastrointestinal complaints, uh, the arthritis. 
Dr. Alwerder says that range of symptoms is not typical of tuberculosis. So for the past year, he reviewed something no historian ever had. Bolivar's medical records, dating back 10 years before his death in 1830. He investigated a variety of other causes and came to his own conclusion. People develop chronic health problems because of chronic ingestion of arsenic. Yes, arsenic, but not poisoning by political enemies, as in an assassination. Instead, Dr. Alwerder thinks that Bolivar slowly poisoned himself unintentionally. Political leaders of their day may have had VIP medicine. The best treatment available was arsenic. So uh, that was what people reached for when they had unexplained health problems. Arsenic was their aspirin, their common painkiller. Also, Bolivar traveled and battled extensively in Peru and other mountainous areas where arsenic is a common mineral found in groundwater. Look at some of the old autopsies. Dr. Alwater thinks he consumed it too simply by drinking the water. Dr. John Dove is a retired spinal surgeon and a Bolivar scholar. He says if doctors had then treated the poisoning, Bolivar might have lived longer. If he'd been able to come back, and to g uh, gather around him some powerful, like-thinking nation builders, they might have been able to create the ide his ideal of having one Spanish-speaking South American country. It would have been a different world down there. It would have been a different world. So thank you. Medical professionals using modern eyes to peer back into history, viewing Simon Bolivar as if he were their patient today and seeking to change the final line on the life story of El Libertador. Carolyn Persuti, VOA News.